and motivating curriculum challenges students while enabling them to achieve success. For example, watch this teacher deliver instruction that is both appropriate and motivating. About those funny things that we found in the gym. What were those things up on the wall? Shadows. Shadows. Good answer, Erin. Who found a shadow in the room? Did Jennifer find her shadow? Yeah, was up on the wall, huh? Did we pretend to be a funny animal? What was that animal's name? Who can remember? Yeah. All right, Trevor. It was called a groundhog. And we're going to have some stories about shadows today. First, I'm going to show you some kids in our book. They're making funny shadows. Look at this little girl. She's looking at her shadow. Is it big or little? Big. Oh, good answer, guys. You're really paying attention. Thanks. This teacher is using appropriate instruction. It's challenging, but not frustrating. Her instruction is also motivating. Students are participating and interested. Appropriate and motivating instruction lays the foundation for student success. And what's jumping in bed with him? His shadow. His shadow came with him. Everybody has a shadow. You even have a shadow, Jennifer. Selecting the appropriate curriculum is an ongoing process throughout the school year. Start by choosing a set of probes or questions from your lesson material. Then test students by asking increasingly difficult questions until a number of their answers are incorrect. The point where they experience difficulty is where you begin their instruction. The key to motivation is delivery. Delivery means using a brisk pace. Ribs. Good. Humorous. Good. Femur. What do we know about the femur? Largest bone in the body. You're awesome. Largest bone in the body. Okay, radius. Oral responses. The bottom number tells us how many parts are in the hole. What does the bottom number tell us? How many, how many parts are in a hole? Good job. And the top number tells us how many parts of that hole are being used. Look at the first problem again. How many parts are in the hole? Everybody. Four. Four. Let's try that again. I need everybody together. How many parts are in the hole? Four. That was the right way. Effective grouping. Good job. What color, Davey? Oh, that's what color That's is this? Right. You did it just the right way, Daddy. Thank you. All right. It is red. What's that? And lots of praise and encouragement. What is it called? A uh, groundhog. Good using your words. Candace, what is this? Good using your words. Merlinda, what is this? Oh, good talking, Merlinda Groundhog. The third step is maintain on-task behavior. For maximum learning, students should be on task at least 85% of the time. This teacher effectively delivered instruction, enabling her students to exceed the 85% goal. Record student progress on a daily basis. That's right, turn on the water. Let me help you. Good job, okay. Oh, you got your hands wet. There's your soap. Rub, rub, rub. Good boy, rub. Rub those hands. Add a boy. Yeah. Then evaluate whether or not students master the day's material at 80% or better. If students fail to achieve mastery, then adjust the curriculum. For example, this teacher's students mastered the first two days' lessons, but the next three lessons they scored less than 80%. 
so the teacher adjusted the material to include zoo animals, a concept they had recently mastered. Let's watch. What do you think that one is? An elephant. An elephant. Very good. You think you're right? <gasps> it is. Oh, such good watchers up here. Ready? A horse. By using this process, the teacher assures that her students receive the most appropriate curriculum for their developmental age in a matter that's motivating to them. Let's review today's presentation. Will someone please describe the first step in selecting an appropriate curriculum? Yes, Elizabeth. Well, the first step is to probe. In other words, the teacher keeps asking difficult questions until the student is no longer able to answer those questions. It's at this point you begin your instruction. Well done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Coach, would you help us with the second step? <coughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think what he's trying to say is Effective delivery is the key to a motivating lesson. That means using a brisk pace, oral responses, effective grouping, and lots of praise. When you do that, students stay on task. Yes. Let's watch another teacher deliver effective instruction. First step for flying directions. By the show of hands, who can tell me? Oh, look at all these guys raising their hands. They all remembered last week's discussion. Um, Doug. The first step for following a direction is? Look at the person. Why do we look at the people? What does that tell the person that asked us to follow direction? Then. The final step, as you remember, is to monitor the student's progress daily, evaluate it, then make the necessary adjustments. Any questions? I've got this student that is driving me crazy. She's always misbehaving. Can somebody help me? If she is not progressing adequately, check that the skill she's learning is useful to her. Also, her misbehavior may indicate that either the curriculum is too hard or perhaps too easy. Consider the pace of your instruction and whether you need to increase your positive reinforcement. Good information, Mr. Moore, but oh, you need to work on your delivery. Positive responses are positive comments or actions to students who demonstrate favorable behavior. For example, watch this teacher give effective positive responses to a student. Yeah, thanks for getting that cursive out and getting started right away. Super job. And Richard, you knew exactly what to do. Garrett's on task. Nice job, Paul. You got ready right away. Now observe this teacher presenting ineffective positive responses. Good job, Lucy. Thank you, Jenny. Good job, Mark. As you can see, there is more to a positive response than simply saying, good job. In this program, you will learn how to give effective positive responses. Okay. Remember, those who give at least four positives for every negative response create an environment where students are motivated and want to attend. Four to one? That's right. If you think about the student's classroom and social behavior, as well as their academic performance, then four positives to one negative is practical. In fact, when students are learning a new skill or behavior, you may need to increase your positive responses significantly, 25 or 30 to 1, to support the student's progress. Let's begin. Here are three ways to make your positive responses more effective. First, be specific. Watch this teacher Thank deliver you. specific Boy, Dave, positive statements to your students. Thanks, Dave. 
Jason's following directions. Boy, Casey's whole desk is cleared off. Mr. Bias, make sure you pay these people cash. Nothing on the floor. Ooh, I like the way this looks. Good. Eyes up front. I think we're ready to go on. I've got Jared's a good listener. You can tell his feet are on the floor. He's got his eyes up here. We're ready to go. All right. How many of you remember what a denominator is? What's a denominator? James, thanks for raising your hand. Because the teacher specifically complimented the student on raising his hand, the boy will more likely repeat this desired behavior. Second, respond positively to appropriate behavior immediately after it occurs. Rather than sitting at their desks, watch this teacher and paraeducator create a positive environment by enthusiastically greeting students as they enter the classroom and immediately rewarding those who come prepared. You got your calculator? All right, Daryl. Good job. Make sure you sign in and get to work on that uh, warm-up up there. Hey, Randy. Hey, Did you have a nice night last night? Yeah. Jeremy, you look good, dude. Hi, ah! Good job, Randy. Hey, give me five. This is a, like a give me five session. I hope session. the rest of the day goes, dude. Good morning, No, it sir. will. Hey, nice job. Good teacher pleaser there. Okay, you got your paper you're going to get out and get started? Hey, good work. Christina. Hi, Jess. It's nice to see you. I mean Hey, Joey. How are you? Amy. <laughs> Ali. Yeah. Adam, you Jeremy, you're so fast. Thanks for getting started. Let me see it, and then I'll give you a late five on you. <laughs> hey, Byron, how are you? Okay. Good. Oh, Kevin, there's your calculator. Nice job. I got so many people doing the warm up. Right, Good thanks. work. Joey, you are on time. Woo! Oh, mm, good copy. Okay, go ahead and sign in. Oh, let me see a calculator. Thanks for getting started. There you go. Sign in and go ahead and do the overhand. Acknowledging the student's behavior good, right Andy. after it occurs helps the student realize what behavior resulted oh, in the positive response. Finally, use a variety of positives. As you know, there are many ways to say, good job. A plus job. Absolutely. Admirable. Bingo. Bravo. Give me five. Good job. Good thinking. Great. High five. Hot dog. How nice. Nice job. Nothing can stop you. But physical gestures such as smiling, winking, and thumbs up also increase the variety. Wow, that's great! Let's watch this teacher use the three strategies we've discussed. While you watch, I will tally the number of positives and negative responses that she provides. Hi, Amber, how are you today? I'm fine. Good, would you please get your book out, the K, and get your top tray put away quickly so we yeah. can get started? Hi, Stephanie, how are you today? Good job. I'm glad you're here this morning, right on time. Please put your name and date on your point sheet. Wait, Stephanie, would you put that on the table for me so it's not in our way this morning? I need to get your, your book, The K, out. Hi, Chris. Hi, Anthony. Hello. How are you guys this morning? Mm -hmm. Hi, I guess. Hi. Pretty good? Late night, Anthony? Mm, not yeah. really. <laughs> Please get your book out, The K. I'd like you to start reading Chapter 18 as soon as you have your name and date filled out on your point sheet, and we'll get started this morning. Chris, thanks for raising your hand. All right, thanks for raising your hand quietly that time. Anthony, do you need a pencil? Thank you. Good job. Trish, do you need one? Boy, good job, Amber. Can you stop for a minute and get your name and date on your point sheet for me, please? Whitney, thanks for coming in quietly, even though you were kind of late this morning. I appreciate that. You didn't disrupt the group. Would you please get your name and date on your point sheet and then go ahead and start reading Chapter 18? Nice job being on task. Bonus start for you. You got ready right away. Good job. Stephanie, nice job getting started. Amber, thanks for following that direction to get your name and date on your point sheet. 
this teacher exceeded the ratio by increasing her positives and keeping her negatives low. She provided 10 positives to no negative responses. Keep in mind, positives can be anything from a simple greeting or acknowledgement to praising a student's performance. Finally, her positives were specific, immediate, and varied. Remember, when applying these three strategies, be sincere and establish eye contact. Using eye contact when giving positive responses suggests to students that they are special. So get results. Be positive. A structured daily schedule is a daily outline of classroom activities designed to maximize student learning. Here's an example of a teacher presenting a daily schedule. Okay, let's review today's schedule so that you'll know what's going on. This morning we're going to start in home base from 8.15 to 8.30. From 8.30 to 9.15 we'll be in Core 1, which is our reading group. From 9.15 to 10 we'll be in Core 2, which is our math group. And from 10 to 10.15 we'll be in recess. From 10.15 to 11, we'll go to Core 3 for History. Chris, thanks for keeping your chair on the floor. I really appreciate it. Give yourself a plus. From 11 to 11.45, we'll be in Core 4 for Science. Tricia, good job keeping your pencil quiet and your feet on the floor. Give yourself a bonus star. I really appreciate that. I can tell that you're listening because your eyes are up here. From 11.45 to 12.15, we'll go to lunch. From 12.15 to 12.45, we'll be playing softball on the tournament teams that you guys have been on all this month. And from 12.45 to 2.30, we'll be going on our field trip to Butler. And from 2.30 to 2.50, we'll have cleanup and silent reading. Structuring time through a planned daily schedule of specific activities and transitions maximizes on-task behavior and minimizes students' inappropriate behavior. Let's design a daily schedule for an elementary classroom. Here are a few rules to follow. First, list school activities over which you have no control, such as lunch, or an assigned time to use the media center. Second, identify the non-academic but necessary tasks such as announcements, taking attendance, lunch count, recess, and so on. Finally, schedule your instructional activities. Homeroom is first, followed by language arts. Then we'll transition into math, followed by recess another transition before history, then change over to science. Next is lunch, then the media center is scheduled, of course recess again, then time to come back in for cooperative learning, and finally we clean up and dismiss. Now let's look at the schedule to see if it maximizes student learning activities. Maximizing student learning activities means academics or IEP goals should comprise 70% of the school day or more. In this schedule, only 65% of the time is spent in learning activities. So what do I need to do? You can increase instructional activities by streamlining non-academic activities and decreasing transition time. Here are some suggestions. First, organize your materials ahead of time. Also, Start and end each activity on schedule. And don't forget, reinforce and praise students who transition quickly, like this teacher. All right, what I'd like you to do is finish up, put your pencils and crayons away. You can finish your poison later. You can finish your coral reef later. Stick your books in your desk quietly, your pencils, your paper, and let's get ready to go on to math. Thank you. Boy, Dave's doing it quickly and quietly. Thanks, Dave. Jason's following directions. Boy, Casey's whole desk is cleared off. Mr. Baez, make sure you pay these people cash. Nothing on the floor. Ooh, I like the way this looks. Good. Eyes up front. I think we're ready to go on. Now it's your turn. Okay. I can shorten my morning announcements and then have time for silent reading. Uh, lunch really ends at 12.15. That would be a good time for me to read to the class. Finally, instead of recess, I'll teach P.E. How's that? Looks good. You've scheduled 84% of your day with learning activities. 
now you are ready to post the schedule in a conspicuous location. Younger students may not be able to read and others may have difficulty. If so, you might include pictures like this. Secondary students should have a copy of the schedule to include in their notebooks. This teacher posted and presented the schedule and is now reviewing it to ensure the students understand. Let's see if you understand what's going to happen today. Whitney, what time will we have recess? Ten. Good job. Give yourself a plus. You were listening. Anthony, we're going to do reading at what time today? Uh, 8.30. Good job. We're going to do reading at 8.30, which will be core one. Chris, what time are we going to have lunch? Um, at 1.45. Good job. Trish, when are we going to go on our field trip today? Um, 12.45. Good. Stephanie, is our field trip going to be before or after lunch? Once you have posted and explained the schedule, stick to it. If an adjustment is necessary, post the change and make sure the students understand. Watch. Now, while you're working on your journal entry for our wisdom over here, I want to explain to you the schedule change for today because of the assembly. First period will be from 8.10 to 8.55, kind of like a normal schedule. Second period is 9 o'clock, 9.40. Then we're going to jump over to fifth period. And it'll be from 9.45 to 10.25. Then we'll have our lunch, come back and do sixth period, seventh period, then we'll go over to third period. Then fourth period is going to be the last period of the day. Then we'll all go into the assembly in the auditorium from 2 o'clock to 2.55. And then remember, after the assembly's over, the building's supposed to be cleared at 3.05. Any questions? Yes, sir, Adam. Um, is our lunches at the same time as usual? <clears throat> our lunches are at the same time. And anybody that serves lunch, just serve lunch like you normally would. I appreciate you raising your hand like that. Any other questions on this? Let's review what we've discussed. Develop a structured daily schedule that allocates at least 70% of the time to learning activities. Post it. Present it. Today's schedule is... Review it. Julie, what time will we start? Stick to it. Class, it's 10 o'clock. Time to put away your reading materials and pull out your math. And clearly communicate any changes. Training and development are essential to ensure staff members are knowledgeable and competent in the use of behavioral techniques and other teaching strategies. Staff training should be ongoing throughout the school year and may include formal presentations, informal conferences, and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Some of my staff are confused about using certain behavioral interventions. It sounds like staff training is what they need. So where do I begin? Start by conducting a skills and needs assessment. Questionnaires are often used to identify staff skills and needs. Also, be sure to ask your staff for ideas. They're well aware of current training issues and pressing concerns. Next, select a method to deliver the training. For example, a formal presentation may meet your staff needs. These are often conducted at the beginning of the school year. Districts and schools can combine resources to hire consultants who are experts in their fields. These experts may also be highly skilled staff from your schools or neighboring districts. Frequently, this type of training occurs on a one-time only basis with no further contact from the presenter. While a formal presentation works well for motivated staff, Wow, this could really work well with my kids. Others may not acquire the skills on their own and need additional practice and assistance. How much longer can this last? 
Formal presentations that have follow-up and support as part of the training program are most effective. Another training method that lends itself nicely to follow up and support is informal conference. Informal conferences are usually spontaneous and follow a problem situation. Guys, thanks for staying because re we need really to review um, the timeout procedures. I don't think we've been real consistent with this and um, we need to be. When a problem occurs, supervisors can solve it by following these steps. Let's watch this administrator conduct an informal conference by first identifying the problem, then recommending an intervention. So what happened on the bus this morning? Um, Judy said that the bus driver said that she picked Bob up and the minute she picked him up he started running up and down the aisles and then um, was she asking him to sit down? Yeah, she asked him to sit down. He was, you know, he was totally oblivious. And then he hit one of the kids. Hmm. Is the kid okay? Yeah. She was crying, but she's okay. But... So where's, and... was this Bob that hit? Where's he at now? Okay, so after, she, after he had hit her, uh, Judy decided just to go around the block because it wasn't very far away, and she just dropped him back off at home. Okay. Um... It doesn't sound to me like the driver handled it the right way, though. So why don't we do this? Um, why don't you ride with the bus for a while and, and just do some precision commands with Bob for a while? And what I want you to do on a precision command is the first thing you do is, is just say, please, uh, if, if Bob's out of his seat or something like that, you just say to Bob, Bob, please sit down. Okay. And then count to five silently and then if he doesn't sit down you're going to issue another precision command to him Bob you need to sit down now okay and and I think if we can have you ride the bus for a while and do those precision commands it'll help okay great listen do you want me to go over this with the bus driver the procedure for the next couple yeah of weeks? yeah I think that'll really help so do I. if you if you make sure the driver knows what's going on and make sure the driver knows how to do precision camp commands it ought to, it ought to solve all the problems okay sounds good after the two staff members implement the intervention, the administrator will evaluate the outcome and modify the training if necessary. A third form of staff training is one-on-one -on -one or hands-on instruction. This method enables the supervisor to use effective strategies while training a staff member in a constructive and positive environment such as a classroom. One-on-one -on -one is especially useful when training new staff. In this setting, the supervisor uses best practices such as hands-on experience, immediate feedback, and ongoing support to teach staff new skills or concepts. One-on-one -on -one training also allows staff to ask questions when they are unsure how to proceed. And a circle that looks just like mine. Okay, now, does it need to be blue like yours? Not necessarily. Tomorrow with the group that you'll be working with, we're just focusing in on the shape. So I, I, okay? could, I could choose sure. this and uh -huh. it's okay. okay let's Great, go. you found a circle. It looks like mine. It's round. Mm -hmm. So we're not focusing in on the color. Right. Okay? If well implemented, these three training strategies will increase staff skills and improve student performance. However, administrators and supervisors face a monumental challenge. That is, encouraging an often overworked staff to actively participate in the training, then return and apply the new skills on the job. I can't take another one! No! I know. My staff often complains about attending end service or else they bring other work to do during the training. That often happens. It's important, especially with formal presentations, to offer support and incentives that your staff really use, such as cash inducement, college credit, other instructional resources, Whoa. or release time. Okay, let me see if I understand. 
First, I assess my staff skills and needs. Based on that information, I determine how best to deliver the training, then provide incentives and support for their participation. Finally, I follow up to assist my staff in applying their new skills. That's right. To get the most out of your training, make certain the content is well designed, effectively delivered, and meets the participants' needs. I can begin using this right away. You certainly can. Now that you've caught the bug, share it with your staff. But if I do that, we'll have staff infection. Whoa! Environmental engineering is a formal term for arranging the physical surroundings of an instructional setting to enhance student learning and behavior. For example, this represents a traditional arrangement for large group instruction. Thank you very much for coming in and getting ready to start. In contrast, this instructor's arrangement is better suited for a small group. Another arrangement is, oops, sorry. Coach, are you in there? Yes, I'm here. Now don't get any ideas about arranging my instructional environment. This has worked just fine for 20 years. I understand, but there are some excellent reasons for making a few adjustments. Such as? Well, to begin, a carefully arranged instructional setting will promote student learning and decrease behavior problems. In other words, it's an effective preventative technique. Also, modifying the environment is usually a low-cost intervention. Low cost? That's right. For example, you can rearrange your desks or change student seating and it won't cost you a cent. Hmm. Okay, I'm listening, but I'm not promising anything. That's fine. First, consider the instructional format you use most frequently. For example, if you use large group instruction, then the seating arrangement should allow students to easily see you, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, right. Gotcha. Well done, coach. But remember, an instructor needs to be visible positive and oh yeah i remember hi, uh, visible positive hi, and active Allison. hi jessica hi glad you guys are on time good to see you hey joey you're on time in contrast if you use small group instruction you'll need a table or floor space to accommodate you and your students i can do that what's next Arrange seating so that you can easily move about and interact with students. Okay, see what kind of idiot they are. Are you deciding okay. to and to oh, never keep mad at me involved in your group? Okay. So. Also, ensure that students with physical or sensory impairments have clear access to and are informed of any changes in the classroom design. Finally, Easily distracted students should be seated in areas that are conducive to learning. Remember, if seating changes are made, whenever possible, announce them to the student ahead of time and provide a rationale. Now watch. I know. Remember when we talked yesterday yeah. about um, how you're having a little bit of a difficult time paying attention when you're with Joey and Byron? Well, what I've decided is maybe if you sat up further to the front, you could ask questions of me, you could pay attention a little bit better. So you okay. see, the, see the seat right up there? Yeah. Why don't right you move up, up there? Okay. Hey, okay, thanks, Kyle. Hey, thanks. You're doing a good job. Kyle, thanks a lot for just coming over and doing that. I appreciate it. Finally, each area of the classroom should have a specific purpose. Designating specific areas of your room for work or free time activities 
will help students understand the behavior expectations for those locations. Also, you may want to label specific areas as off-limits, such as your file cabinet or desk. Time out. I've got a question. Sure, Coach. Shoot. Are there areas outside of my classroom that can be off-limits too? Absolutely. For example, hallways or bathrooms could be off-limits during instructional time unless the student is issued a pass. Locations without a designated purpose encourage loitering behaviors that may become problematic. Okay, Coach. Follow this game plan and score big with your class. Recently, Coach Riley received training in how best to arrange his classroom to enhance student learning. Coach, show us your new game plan. Okay, team. First, you got to decide how you're going to teach. After I decided, I lined my students up here, here, and here so they can clearly see what I'm telling them. Now Jack is always off size before I start. So I have him sit in front by me so he won't talk to his buddies. I put this table here to huddle with team members when a little pep talk is needed. This line of scrimmage down my center aisle is for Jill, our star player, so she can easily go anywhere in the room. Over here, these areas are for group projects and independent study. And this area behind my desk is out of bounds to students. Now I can rush in and tackle any problem. All right, any questions? Coach, where are your rules posted? Right here in front, where everyone can see them. This will be good for my classroom, but what about lunchtime? It's always so chaotic. Huh, good point. Uh, any ideas? I know. I once saw a school that used a stoplight system, you know, in their lunchroom and their library to signal the students when their behavior was appropriate and when it wasn't. See, si. Let's keep score and reward them with fun activities for good behavior. Excellent idea. Thank you. Anything else? All right, let's get out there and score some points. Woo! Instructional pacing is the speed or rate at which an instructor presents a lesson. Watch Mr. Hill use a brisk pace when calling steps. There are sound instructional reasons for doing so. First, a brisk pace requires these dancers to focus their attention on his calls. And second, the more steps he calls, the more practice these folks receive which in turn makes them better square dancers. The same rule applies in the classroom. Student learning increases when teachers present instruction using a brisk pace. Watch. Uh, ribs. Good. Humorous. Good. Femur. What do we know about the femur? Before instruction begins, Organize your materials to prevent any interruptions, such as looking for misplaced items. Also, review the lesson to identify difficult concepts. Some students may require additional examples and instruction to master certain concepts. Now you're ready to begin teaching. Remember, a brisk pace enhances student learning. If your pace is too fast, there's bound to be confusion. If your instruction is too slow, yes, well, I, I think you've got the picture. Watch this teacher's instructional pace. It's brisk, but students keep up with the lesson. Okay. Good. We just went over the steps for following directions. Let's go over these as a group. Okay, the first step is to do what? Look at the person, okay? The second step is to do what? Say okay. 
Say okay, and everybody's done that. What's the third step? Do the task immediately. Do the task immediately. How long should that be? Casey? This teacher's pace allowed students to respond <laughs> correctly seconds. while maintaining okay. their attention. Right What's the fourth step? Asking questions and providing feedback are excellent ways to maintain student interest. But be sure to ask the questions at a pace consistent with the ongoing instruction. Research indicates that waiting three to five seconds for a student to respond is appropriate. If students answer correctly, be sure to praise them. Remarks such as, way to go, or you've got it, motivate students and encourage their participation. However, if the student's answer is wrong, provide prompts to help the student answer correctly. Then don't forget to reinforce the student for trying again. Finally, so manage classroom behavior in a way that does not and interrupt example, the instructional pace. The for example, watch this teacher use positive reinforcement and shell. token rewards in a way that complements the instruction shells. and does not slow the pace. A univalve has one shell. Tell me an animal that we talked about yesterday that has no shells. No shells, Bill. A squid. Squid has no shells, just floats around has its own defensive organism. Something else that has no shell, Casey. An octopus. Octopus has no shell, great. Look at these people raising their hands. Trick question. Tell me something that has two shells. Name a bivalve for me. Mike, you've been waiting quietly. Let's review today's instruction. Students learn more when lessons are conducted at a brisk pace. There are eight parts in that fraction being used. How many parts are being used? Eight. That was the right way. Good job, Trish. How many parts are being used in that fraction? Eight. Good job, plus for you. Anthony, listen carefully to this question. How many parts are in the whole on that question? Four. Good job. There are four parts in the whole. Eight parts are being used. So are more parts being used, an equal part being used, or less parts being used? Everybody. More. Good job. More parts are being used, so circle more. To facilitate a brisk pace, this teacher has her lesson materials ready. I'm passing out the worksheet for today and I'd like you to put a proper heading at the top, which is your name and the date. As soon as you've done that, look at me please so I know that you're ready to go. Then she determines an optimal pace by monitoring students' comprehension through their responses. Does that fraction equal one, everybody? No! Good job, that was the right way to answer. Whitney, how do you know that fraction doesn't equal one? Because the top number is higher than the lower number. Very good, plus for you. The, bigger, the top number is bigger than the bottom number. She maintains this pace when asking questions and giving corrective feedback. There are eight parts in that fraction being used. How many parts are being used? Eight. That was the right way. Good job, Trish. How many parts are being used in that fraction? Eight. Good job, plus for you. Anthony, listen carefully to this question. How many parts are in the whole on that question? Four. Good job. There are four parts in the whole. Eight parts are being used. Notice how she manages classroom behavior. It doesn't detract from the pace of the lesson. You use more than four parts in that one, don't you? Thanks for keeping your pencil down, Whitney. Good job. I need your eyes up here and pencils are down. Super. The bottom number tells us how many parts are in the whole. What does the bottom number tell us? Instructional pacing is like dancing. You one, can be successful moving two, slowly. Three. One, two, <sighs> three. But you risk losing your partner's interest. On the other hand, if you go too fast. <laughs> but your instruction may not be successful. Instead, instructional pacing is a finely choreographed performance between student interest and student success. Home notes are an excellent way to provide communication between an instructor and parent and are an effective method for improving students' academic or social behaviors. In this example, a teacher uses home notes to encourage homework completion. Now that we've practiced negotiating, 
here's what I want you to do. I want you to take an assignment home for homework. It'll be attached to your home note. You need to figure out a situation at home that you would negotiate in. Would it be with your brother, your mom, your grandpa, your neighbor? You need to write down on your home note what that situation would be and how you handled it. Did you use the steps? Did you go through the things we've talked about? The final thing you need to do is have your parents sign it. I want to make sure your parents know that you're working on this skill at home. Home notes can be an effective intervention for students with academic or classroom behavior problems. But for home notes to be successful, there are two key requirements. You must have parents' cooperation and meaningful rewards to motivate students' participation. Our homework is due tomorrow. Bring it back on your home note and it'll be worth $100. Thanks for raising your hand. If these two requirements are met, then you can begin preparations as shown in this diagram to implement home notes. First, design a simple home note form. Second, meet with the student's parents to confirm cooperation. Then, explain the home note system to the student. Let's examine each in detail. An effective home note includes the student's name, instructor's and parent's signatures, the date, and the target behaviors. Here the instructor listed return daily homework as a target behavior. Finally, instructors and parents can use the comment section for additional communication. For example, an instructor can recognize a student's success or identify the homework assignment due tomorrow. Once the form is designed, you're ready to meet with the parents. First, the instructor and parent should identify academic and classroom behaviors to include on the home note. Examples of such behaviors may include hands in homework on time, completes math assignments, talks in an appropriate tone of voice. With some students, it may be best to focus on one or two behaviors at a time. This is especially true for younger students. Second, identify positive reinforcers to motivate the student and mildly adversive home consequences. Home consequences could limit TV times and programs, bedtimes and access to friends. Third, develop a contingency plan in case the student loses the home note, refuses to take it home, or forgets parts of the note. An appropriate consequence may be loss of privileges both at home and at school. Next, train the parent how to review and initial the note. Then, determine when and how frequently you will use the home note. Initially, home notes are best used on a daily basis. As the student's performance improves, gradually discontinue using the home note. At the conclusion of the meeting, encourage the parents to contact you if they have questions. Provide them with a phone number and time that you are available. These building blocks represent the instructor-parent partnership required for a successful home note program. Finally, explain the home note program to the student. Discuss all parts of the home note form and the student's specific responsibilities. Also, explain the consequences, both positive and negative. Let's review our discussion thus far. Students with academic or social behavior problems may benefit from home notes. Before you start, be certain that you have the parent's support and rewarding consequences. If so, you are ready to begin preparations. First, develop a home note form. Then, meet with the parents. Finally, explain the system to the student. Now you're ready to use the home note at the beginning of the week. At the end of each day, briefly meet with the student to explain that day's performance ratings. When starting the home note program, emphasize the student's performance with primarily good notes. This helps build the student's motivation and may ease parents' concerns that home notes are designed to punish their children. When the note is returned, check for the parent's signature and praise the student for returning it. Let's watch this teacher use home notes with her class. Okay, so let's pass out the home notes. Pete, why don't you come up first? You had a really good day. 
Okay, I've got a 95% and you're on level three. Pete, you are on time. Worked quietly, really good with your assignments. Following instructions, most of the classroom rules. Pete, especially this, I really like the way that you handled it when Mike was pushing your buttons. What do you think you did differently today? Just ignored it. Just ignored it, that's the way to go. Really good day, and I'm gonna put that on here that it was a good day. Okay, make sure that you have your mom sign this and bring it back tomorrow. Right. See you tomorrow, Pete. Thanks. Okay, Israel, you want to come up? Another good day for Israel. You have been doing so well. Okay, Is, just two more days and you'll be on level four. And I'm also giving you an excellent for working on time, following instructions, classroom rules, and handling frustration pretty well. How do you think you did? Pretty good day. Excellent day. Okay, is make sure that you have this sign and bring it back tomorrow. Okay, see ya. Good morning. Home note, please. Way to go. Pete, and you remember to have your mom sign it this time. Way to go. Okay, sit down and get out your vocabulary. Everybody should be here in a couple more minutes. Good morning, Mike. Signed, way to go. Did Gene ride the bus today? No. You didn't see him? Okay. Israel, thank you. Signed, thank you, thank you. Sit down, Is, and get out your vocabulary. Janelle, where's your home note? So it took a while, I was on the bus. Janelle, that's a minus five if you don't bring it in. This is the second time. Every three to four weeks, this teacher will contact parents to review their child's progress. On a cautionary note, some parents may be overly punitive with their child. If so, meet with parents to review acceptable consequences. Discontinue the Home Note program if the problem persists. Remember, Home Notes are primarily a positive means to improve a student's academic or social behavior. verbal statements used to increase student compliance. For example, this teacher will use precision commands to increase a student's compliance to school rules. Nice job walking, Hans. Good. Way to go, ladies. Nice to see you. Good recess? Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Mr. Higginson remembered to walk. Yay. Way to go. Way to go. Hey. Danny. Yeah. Please go back and walk in the hall. Yeah. Just a second. Oh. Danny, you need to go back and walk in the hall now. Oh. All right. Looks good. Come on back. Nice walking this time now. Better way to walk in the building. Thank you. The teacher only used the first two steps of precision commands because the student readily complied. Let's examine each of the steps. First, give a polite, effective command. Danny, please go back and walk in the hall. This teacher began her command with the word please and specifically described what she expected the student to do. To make a precision command more effective, stand within three feet when giving a command. Establish eye contact and use a calm voice like this example. Oh, Danny. Please go back and walk in the hall.
Try it now. Let's return to our seat. Wait. A precision command is not an invitation. Would you like to return to your seat? Hold it. A precision command is not a question. Do you want to get hit? Sit down Stop. now. A precision command is not a threat. A precision command is a precise statement describing what you want the student to do. Okay. Please return to your seat, Alan. Excellent. Now try it from the top. Please return to your seat, Alan. Thanks for following my directions, Alan. That's right. Let's return to our school rules example. In this case, the student failed to comply within three to five seconds. Therefore, go to step number two. Give a second command using signal words, such as, you need to, and now. These words warn the student that an unpleasant consequence will follow if the student fails to comply. Just a second. Danny, you need to go back and walk in the hall now. Oh. Looks good. Come on back. Nice walking this time, now. Better way to walk in the building. Thank you. The student complied within five seconds, so the teacher praised the student. However, if the student fails to comply to the second command, use a pre-planned unpleasant consequence, such as response cost or graduated guidance. After the consequence, restate the second command using signal words. This time, Watch a secondary teacher use precision commands with her students. Now look at this, Maddie. Nikai, please keep the ball on the table. Okay. Look at this, Maddie. Nikai, you need to keep the ball on the table. Okay. Bye. Much better, Nikai. Much better. This teacher successfully gave a polite, effective precision command. The student failed to comply within three to five seconds, so the teacher gave a second precision command using signal words. The student then complied, and the teacher praised the student. The teacher did not need to use steps three or four in this example. Remember, precision commands are most effective when you use a four to one ratio of positive teacher remarks to precision commands. Also, remember to socially reinforce compliance with each precision command. Please pause the video. You need to pause the video now. Thanks for pausing the video. collection is collecting specific information about a student's academic or behavioral performance. Collecting and analyzing data can help an instructor in determining if a student is making progress. For example, while this teacher is providing instruction, the paraeducator is collecting data on a problem behavior, a student's talkouts. The paraeducator is recording each instance Mike speaks without first raising his hand and waiting to be called on. Okay, today we're going to review what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday we talked about nouns. Who can tell me what a noun is? Israel. Excellent. A can person. Can we do those libs today? Mike, that's a talk out. Place or thing. Okay, we also Who talked about... Who sets up lunch today? Excuse me, Mike, you are talking out. Later, 
The teacher and paraeducator will summarize and evaluate the data to determine if changes should be made to Mike's behavior program. Thursday, 7, and then Friday, 10. That's, oh, that's too many. Yeah. That is a lot. What's going on? Is there a certain period or anything that um, seems to be getting more of them? It looks like it's right before lunch. Yep, and I can see that you know, with him. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's always his thing about setting up. I know. He, always, he loves to set up. You know, maybe we can do something like uh, let him, if he doesn't have any talk outs during the period before lunch, that he can always be the one to help the person who is normally assigned to set up that day. Data collection begins with pinpointing the target behavior to be assessed. Data is typically collected on the following types of behavior. Academic, classroom, work-related, and social skills. When selecting the behavior, it is important to use descriptive rather than ambiguous terms. For example, causes problems tells less about a student's behavior than does not follow directions. Likewise, lazy is less informative than does not complete assignments on time. Most parents and instructors can identify a number of behaviors that they would like to see reduced. In general, they include such problem behaviors as talkouts, hitting or disrupting other students, and off-task behaviors. But remember, when identifying behavior that is problematic, it is equally important to select another skill to replace the undesirable behavior. For example, a positive replacement behavior for non-compliance might be following an instructor's directions within 5 to 10 seconds. Similarly, a replacement behavior for interrupts adults and peers might be waits turn to speak when others are talking. Next, define the target behavior. These behaviors must be observable. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And measurable. Observable and measurable refer to behaviors that are easily observed, countable, have a beginning and an end, and are repeatable. Can someone tell me the first correction that needs to be made at number one? Out. For example, the behavior talking out might be defined as when the teacher asks the class a question. The student speaks without raising his hand or waiting to be called upon. <laughs> Once the behavior has been defined, develop a related behavioral objective. That is, determine what you want the student to accomplish. The objective should have three parts. The situation or condition under which the behavior is expected to occur, the behavioral pinpoint or definition, and the criteria for acceptable performance. For example, an academic objective might address basic reading skills in the following ways. Given 30 flashcards with words, Joy will read the words orally within two seconds for each word with 90% accuracy on two consecutive trials. A behavioral objective for social skills might state, when Sally's teacher makes a request, she will comply with the request within five to 10 seconds, 80% of the time for two consecutive weeks. Now you're ready to choose a system of data collection. For best results, use a variety of assessment techniques. Those most commonly selected include collecting academic performance information or permanent product, using behavior checklists, interviewing others, and observing students in classrooms. Work sites. Lunch. Or free time activities. Let's discuss each briefly. 
Behavior problem checklists are lists of specific behaviors completed by persons familiar with the student. Checklists are popular among instructors because they are easy to use and can be helpful in identifying the severity of the behavior problem. But be aware that many checklist items are vague and open to interpretation. Also, many individuals relying on their memory complete checklists after the fact, resulting in questionable or biased data. Behavioral interviews, another technique, involves asking someone information about a subject. Interviews can be conducted with both children and adults. This technique helps establish a relationship with the person giving the information. Interviews are often open-ended, allowing the interviewer to gather additional information as needed. Permanent product recording has been used by instructors for years to grade spelling tests, check arithmetic problems, or count the number of wooden stakes painted by a student. Permanent products are outcomes of behavior and may be tangible items such as worksheets or mastery tests. They may also be environmental outcomes such as a driveway that has been swept clean. Whereas the permanent product method records the outcome of the behavior, observational systems are used to record samples of behavior as they are occurring. There are several basic systems, event recording, interval recording and time sampling, duration recording, and latency recording. Event or frequency recording is used by instructors who are interested in counting the number of times a behavior occurs. A tally is made each time the student engages in the target behavior. This count is made within a specified time, such as a 30-minute math session. Event recording is usually the method of choice when the teacher wants to increase or decrease a behavior. To use event recording, the behavior must be observable and have a clear beginning as well as a clear ending. You can use event recordings for behavior such as talkouts during instruction, raising a hand when the teacher asks a question, temper tantrums, painting a wooden stake, hitting other students. There's nothing fancy about event recording. Frequently, you only need a clipboard, pencil, and paper. Counting devices such as golf and knitting counters are commercially available and make data collection easy and more accurate. But a piece of tape across the wrist with an ink mark for each behavior costs next to nothing and may be just as effective. While versatile, event recording should not be used under the following conditions. When the behavior is occurring at such a high rate that an accurate count is impossible, for example, pencil tapping or when it occurs for extended periods of time, such as out-of-seat behavior. Under these circumstances, you might consider other methods of data collection like interval and time sampling. Interval and time sampling are best used for behaviors that appear continuous. For example, talking with peers or on-task behavior. With these systems, you record an estimate of the actual number of times that a behavior occurs. To use interval recording, break the observation period into short intervals of time, usually from 10 seconds to 1 minute. Then simply note whether the behavior occurred or did not occur during the interval. In this example, 10 second intervals were used to record the behavior working on a task for a one-minute time period. During the time period, the student was on task four out of six intervals. Keep in mind that data from interval recording represents an estimate of behavior rather than an actual count. Regardless of whether the behavior occurs once 
twice or five times. It is checked only once to indicate that it occurred during the interval. However, a problem with interval recording is that it's difficult to teach and collect accurate data at the same time. The necessity of looking down at a stopwatch or data sheet to record the information can be disruptive to any lesson. Often, an observer is required. But there are other solutions. A cassette recorder and a beep tape with timed beeps occurring at specific intervals eliminates the timing issue. The poor deer would sleep outside. Wh which word would it be? Which would it be this kind of deer or this kind of deer? Very nice work. Very good. Another solution is an interval form such as this that incorporates a recording interlude following each interval. Time sampling, a variation of interval recording, provides another option. In time sampling, intervals of a certain length are set up usually in minutes as opposed to seconds. Instead of noting the occurrence or non-occurrence of a behavior throughout the entire interval, the observer looks at the student at only the end of the interval and records whether the behavior is occurring at that instant. Although less accurate than interval, time sampling requires less work and is effective when the instructor is interested in group performance such as counting the number of children doing independent seat work. Another form of data collection is duration recording. Use this method when your primary concern is the length of time the student engages in the behavior. For example, if you want to know about a student's out-of-seat behavior, event or duration recording may work. Event recording tells how many times the student is out of his seat during a time period. Better yet, duration recording tells the frequency and how long the student is out of his seat. To record duration data, start the stopwatch when the student leaves her seat. and stop the watch when the student returns. As with event recording, the behaviors measured must have a clear beginning and an end and not occur too frequently. Another recording system that focuses on time rather than frequency is latency recording. Use latency recording when you're interested in how long a student takes to begin performing a particular behavior once it has been requested. In this situation, the teacher should be concerned with how long it takes the student to get started on his math assignment. To record latency data, note when you give the student a directive and when the student begins the response. Also, remember to record when the student completes the response. Now once you've selected the data system that best fits your needs, determine when to collect data. Identify times to collect data throughout the day or week. These times will vary depending on what target behaviors you select, how frequently they occur, and your available resources. For example, in gathering data on math performance, you might collect information during and after math period. Social behaviors may be more readily assessed during unstructured times such as break, recess, or lunch. Now implement the data collection system. Once you've determined your data collection schedule, stick to it. If data are to be representative of the student's performance, it must be collected on a consistent basis over time. Only then can the effects of program changes or interventions on the student's behavior be determined. Make certain that the data are correct and reliable. Periodically, have a second observer simultaneously observe and record a student's behavior. Then compare the two observations for agreement and inner observer reliability. For a user-friendly discussion on critical reliability issues and procedures, see Alberto and Troutman, 1995. Still with me? <laughs>
<sighs> Next, summarize and graph the data. To be useful, information gathered through data collection must be easily readable. Tallies or other forms of data are difficult to interpret, especially when more than one individual is sharing the information. Graphing data provides an easy and systematic way of displaying information about the target behavior. Graphing is a two-step process. First, convert data to a usable form such as percentages, number correct, or a rate. For example, to calculate a percentage of correct responses, divide the number of correct responses by the total number of responses and multiply by 100. In this case, a student answered 20 math problems correctly out of 40 items possible. Divide 20 by 40. Multiply it by 100 and we see the student scored 50% correct. But what if I want to know the rate? No problem. A rate of correct responding is computed by dividing the number correct by the response time. You try it. Okay, the student correctly completed 20 problems in 30 minutes. 20 divided by 30 equals 0.7 correct problems per minute. That's right. Now plot the data on a graph for visual analysis. Graphs come in all sizes and shapes. Bar graph, ratio graph, cumulative graph, basic line graph. But the most frequently used tool for displaying data is the basic line graph. First, draw an X and Y axis. Label the lines of the graph to show the behavior in time. After labeling, plot the converted data points. Each data point is placed at the intersection of the session and level of behavior. Finally, Utilize the data to make decisions about the student's progress. To determine if a program has been effective, it helps to evaluate trends in performance by focusing on systematic and consistent increases or decreases in behavior. Trends are defined as three or more data points in the same direction. Trends in data indicate the effectiveness of programs and assist in determining the need for program changes. Let's take a look. On this first graph, the teacher is interested in increasing a student's verbal participation in class. According to the data, the student's participation has consistently increased throughout the week. If the student continues to improve, the teacher may choose to discontinue the ongoing program but maintain her level of reinforcement to support the new behavior. On this next graph, the teacher is interested in decreasing off-task behavior. Uh-oh, looks like something isn't working and changes might be needed. Perhaps the reinforcement isn't motivating. Or the procedure may need to be reviewed. Whatever the outcome, we could use more data before making any decisions. Let's review. Data collection is collecting specific information about a student's academic or behavioral performance. These seven steps represent the process you should follow in collecting and analyzing data. The data collection procedures described in this video are fundamental elements in constructing an effective instructional program. Knowing all you can about a student's current level of performance is the foundation on which an effective instructional program is built. But keep in mind, these data collection strategies focus only on the student's behavior. In many situations, we also need to know about the circumstances in which the student's behavior occurs. Are there people? settings, or events that encourage or discourage these behaviors. To answer this question, we use a different set of observation procedures called functional analysis. We'll introduce this new set of data collection strategies in another presentation. Remember, 
The more you understand about collecting data, the better you're able to meet your students' needs. Because an instructor without data is like a hiker without a compass. Teacher! 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 Lost, aren't we? I believe we must reevaluate the situation. Yep, we're lost. Parents must be notified of student difficulties and attempts made to involve them in problem resolution. A parent conference is also an excellent opportunity to discuss a child's success. Parent conferences may include a telephone call informing parents of their child's progress, a meeting to discuss instruction or behavior program changes, encouraging to read anything. I don't have time to talk. Or an unexpected visit or phone call from a parent. I know I don't like to come to school and complain, but I have real concerns and I don't know what to do with it. Conferences can be positive and useful. Whoa, hold on there, ma'am. I don't mind telling y'all, but conferencing is more frustrating to me than trying to shoot a sideline. <laughs> that would be frustrating. But you can learn to conduct successful and positive parent conferences. Are you interested? Does a cowboy drink upstream from the herd? Y'all come in and sit a spell. Don't mind if I do. Now, before communicating with a parent, you need to know why and what you're talking about. It helps to write down all the facts so that you can accurately share the information. Then decide how best to deliver the news. For some situations, a note or telephone call may take the place of a face-to-face -face meeting. Watch this teacher deliver good news to a student's father. Hi, Mr. Johnson. This is Maddie. Yeah, I um, talked to Central High, and um, they're willing to take Lily May because her reading skills have increased, and she's done so well. I know that's neat, especially because she's really wanted to go there. I'm really excited, Sharing too. Sharing positive news with yeah, parents on excited. a frequent basis Good. strengthens uh -huh. the relationship between home yes. and school yes. and helps smooth away really if hard. problems arise. Be congratulated. That's but if my ah. cow folks raise a little too much ah. duck, and I decide to meet with their parents, where do I begin? Start by scheduling adequate time to talk. Also, invite other team members as needed, but use caution. Too many professionals may spook a parent. Keep in mind, if program changes are going to be discussed for a student in special education, provide parents with notice of the proposed changes prior to the meeting. Don't forget to include the time, location, and names of individuals who will be attending the conference in the invitation. When the parent arrives, invite them to hang their hat, then make the appropriate introductions. Hi. Hi. Mrs. Bowman, glad you could make it today. Hi. This is Claudia Watson. How She's our do? principal, and Marcia Trujillo is the assistant that Hi, works Marcia. with me in the classroom. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Bowman. Have a seat. Okay. And being in an atmosphere is... where the parent feels comfortable. State the reason for the conference. To see eye to eye, use precise, clear language when discussing the situation. Some of the weaknesses that we need to address. Avoid using educational jargon. For example, Hyperactive. ADHD. IQ. Contingency. Differential reinforcement. LRBI. Token economy. Response cost. Consequence. Due process. then offer possible solutions. And so when homework is assigned, please make sure, you know, that that is done. Encourage him to read anything. I don't pick up the TV guide. I mean, mm -hmm. the cereal box. Just encourage him to read. Let him see you reading. Mm -hmm. Also, parent input is critical. Okay. Uh, what can I do to encourage him at home? Throughout the conference, ask for their feedback to assist in making team decisions. I, I was concerned, what are the mastery tests like? Oh, the what? mastery test? 
now agree upon a plan. Be willing to negotiate. You may need to collect further information and schedule additional meetings. If you get stuck at the crossroads, invite other individuals to the next conference who have the authority to make the big decision. Uh, even though Ms. Valentine and Mrs. Trujillo work very hard to keep the classroom structured, when these boys and girls are outside at recess time, they are under the same expectation as all of the other boys and girls. Finally, set deadlines and follow up in a reasonable amount of time. Discuss how plans are progressing and make changes if needed. So the contract will begin, how about tomorrow? All right, okay. September 21st, and let's go one, two, three, four days till September 21, 22, 23, 24, 25th. Let's review it maybe day after tomorrow, okay? Take a look at the contract again and see how we're doing, all right? Following these steps will help increase parents' cooperation and support. Remember, issues discussed during meetings must be kept confidential. Make a record of it and keep it under your hat. Okay? How you doing, Tex? All right, I suspect. But what about those pesky parents who phone or drop in unexpectedly? When this happens, your best response is to listen closely. You know I don't like to come Watch. to school and complain. But I, I have real concerns and I don't know what to do with it. Mike's not doing well. He's not doing well here. He doesn't want to be here. He tells me things that are negative about the staff and I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate what you guys are doing to him here. And I want him over at Hillcrest on a full-time basis. I don't want him here. Okay, Marty, let's talk about that. Now, what's Mike If the parent is upset, he's most acting upset defensively only puts a burr under their saddle and escalates an already difficult situation. Instead, this teacher loosens the cinch by carefully listening and identifying the parent's purpose or goal. Okay, I think Mike is making progress. And I'm really pleased that he's gotten on the medication now, and I appreci appreciate your support with Thank that. You. Thank you. Uh, that really is helping uh, Mike a lot. Uh, in spite of what Mike's reporting to you, we actually are seeing some progress here with Mike. I know that. Now the teacher is Good. able to direct that. the discussion oh, well, toward Mike, a win-win yeah, solution. I, I think a key with Mike, Marty, and, and you and I have done this well in the past, and I hope we can continue to do that, is refocus Mike. Okay. Sometimes when he has an issue, it's actually very small. But to Mike, it looks very, very big. That's true. And I think in the past, he has a tendency to just kind of focus on mm -hmm. the negative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when he comes home, if maybe you could redirect him or call me and talk to me, and we'll talk about the good things he's doing. Let me see if I follow your drift. First... Before I contact the parent, I need to make sure I have all the facts and know what I'm talking about. Then I decide how best to deliver the information to the parents. If I decide to meet with the parent, then I follow these here steps to make sure I have their support and cooperation. Also, if program changes are being discussed for a student in special education, I must provide parents with a written invitation and prior notice. On the other hand, if a parent comes up behind me unexpected-like, I'll remember to listen and listen good. Then, I identify the reason the parent came in in the first place, iron out our differences, and agree on a solution. That's right, Tex. Like my trail boss always said, there's a lot more to conferencing than just sitting in the saddle and letting your feet hang down. Specialized equipment or assistive technology is any tool used to increase the productivity, independence, and integration of students with functional disabilities. For example, this computer-generated speech device increases David's ability to interact with his teacher and fellow students. Selecting specialized equipment to support an appropriate education program for students with disabilities is the responsibility of the IEP team. 
I have a student starting this fall who might need assistive technology. Where do I begin? Perhaps the Director of Assistive Technology at Utah State University, Martel Menlove, is a good place to start. Hello, come in. Hi, Dr. Menlove. I'm Andrea Holyoke. I'm the teacher from Granite School District. I had called you earlier about the student with the visual and mobility impairments, and sure. I'm in desperate need of a crash course in assistive technology. Well, come on. Let me show you some things that we have available. Oh, great. That'd be great. The first step in selecting assistive technology is to know what's available. Certainly. Uh, let me show you some of the things that are available. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some things that are high-tech, complicated, some okay. things that are medium-tech, and some things that are very low-tech. Um, let me just start out. Uh, this is what's called a Canon communicator. It's a mm -hmm. communication device for an individual who cannot speak. Uh, this particular device, you punch in what you want to say. Uh, it prints it out on this little piece of paper so you can then uh, tear it off and just show it to the other person and they can oh. read what's there. Okay. Uh, this one works a little bit differently. This is called a light writer. It has an LCD printout on this side and one on this side. Oh, so, I so can you're type able to what I'm doing. Yeah, read exactly. it on this side. And you so can read it on okay. that side. This one also has a memory to it that you could actually put pre-program things in here, so I could actually program in there. You know, give me a Big Mac, uh, order of fries, and oh. a large Coke, and walk into McDonald's and simply okay. push one button, and it would and it would it would show up, show up as a so, memory. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a device that is quite common and really there are quite a few of them around. This is called a TDD or a telecommunication device for the deaf. Okay, now what, this, now what is this? I well, this allows someone who is deaf to use the telephone. What happens is you just take the regular telephone and place it in this rocker like this. Okay. Uh, a person is then able to simply type their message in here. It goes over the telephone line. Someone on the other end of the telephone line with the TDD It'll read out right would across here. Would receive the message. Would oh, receive the message. Okay. They would then receive the message, type back in. It would come back across, and you'd be able to read what was there and whatever. Oh, If okay. one person had a TDD and the other person was just on the telephone, mm -hmm. in Utah there's what's called the Utah Relay System, and I can call this relay operator and tell the relay operator, I need to talk to someone who has a TDD. I can talk to them on the telephone, give my message to the person at the relay system. And they, they will then use the TDD and talk to someone so I can communicate and And be and somewhat forth. of like a mediator sure. between the two people. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just, just okay, so if if I wanted to try to find one of these, where where would I go? Oh, they're available. Uh, you can buy them at Fred Meyer, Walmart. Oh, so they're very uh, available. Radio Shack, yeah. Also, I think the cheapest way to buy them is from the Public Service Commission, and I could get you information on how to buy them from them later on. Great. Anyway, these are kind okay. of uh, high-tech complicated type things. There's also some, some very simple things. Um, this is uh, a voice activated uh, calculator. Oh. Uh, a student who either cannot hear or maybe has trouble even processing things okay. visually could process them. Two, not, two, oh, my goodness. Four, okay. Okay. And it also eight, 11, will tell you the time of day, uh, whatever. But there's a lot of things that have voice output on them like this. Okay. Uh, some things are much simpler than that even. Um, here's just a pen that has a different type of grip to it, very low tech. Okay. Here's another one that's a pen that has a very low tech. So we've tech. got lots of different options. Lots of different options. Okay. And these are, these are ones that are bought commercially, but there's also some other options. Uh, you can just take a regular pencil. These are pencil grips that you can buy at the store. Oh, yeah, you've I've seen, seen those. Before. Yeah. But these are kind of ex expensive. We usually tell people, you've probably seen these before too, the old rollers. rollers. Yeah. Uh, you can take these and pull these apart and stick this on here. For a better, for a, softer... For a softer grip. So okay. there are a lot of things that are available that you can just buy at the store. Okay. Uh, we do a lot of things with Velcro, uh, hooking things together with Velcro. Sometimes students in school have trouble with things uh, slipping and sliding on their desk or something. Uh, you can buy this stuff here. There's just liner for drawers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Stick it on a student's desk, and now things don't always slide off of it. And then it doesn't, of it. Yeah, don't have the there. problem. Okay. Or even something, you've probably seen these before, too. The good old soap holders that you stick yeah, on. Yeah, that you stick yeah. on. And well, again, it's something them. you can put on a student's desk and put it here and put something on top of it so, so it doesn't slide around. It doesn't have There are a lot of really low. It's interesting, too. You need to be careful because there are, you know, you can look at different types of devices that will work. This has got a key holder. It doesn't have a key in it, but if it had a key in it, it would allow someone with poor grip to open to a door, to, something okay, like that. Okay, so it's more of a grip. Yeah, so this, is, this would be a low tech. Um, okay. This is something, uh, you know, that I use on my car a now. Car. The and car. they come standard. Yeah, they come standard. So, okay. you know, this, is, this does the same thing as this in, in unlocking a door. This is a little more high tech than this. 
Okay. Um, some things that students with hearing impairments, uh, this is just a, and again, this came from Radio Shack. It's just an amplifier. It has a couple of microphones in it. The student puts it on his head. Whatever's said in the room is amplified. They can okay. hear it. And okay. what you end up with is students oftentimes are more willing to use something like this than they are a hearing aid because this look, just looks like a... Like they carry a Walkman like or something. Like a Walkman or something okay. like that. So this is cool to use. Yeah. So they'll, they'll use this type of thing and oftentimes... Feel a little more willing to use something like that. Yeah, a little like more that. willing to use something like that. Okay. And again, this just came from... Uh, let me show you a couple of other medium tech type things. Uh, okay. Some medium tech type things that have to do with mobility because your student may have some mobility concerns. Actually, um, that's, that's very true. I have been made aware that my student does have some mobility yeah. problems. Uh, someone who's in a wheelchair may want to use a device such as this. It's just called a reacher which okay. would allow them to sit in a wheelchair and reach something up high on a shelf or something on the floor. And these are pretty oh. good in that they can pick up a piece of paper Anything. Uh, or okay. something that's even heavier, uh, such as So they've got a, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty they're, steady. Yeah. There are these rubber grips on the end there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this one is uh, a folding oh. one. There's folding ones, there's ones that don't fold and whatever else. Okay. Um, also, you can see here on the wall uh, this pair of crutches uh, that a student might use. Again, their oh. student size. Uh, okay. Another thing that you see often with a student with mobility, and this is kind of a medium tech device, it's called a walker. A walker. Uh, okay. This one is more of an adult size. Oftentimes you'll see them with wheels on them and whatever else, but again, something that a student can rely on to help walk. And you can adjust these to however tall or short Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one has adjustments on it uh, here. Uh, also, you can buy them at different sizes Great. and whatever else. Great. Okay? okay. Let me show you a couple of things you mentioned that, you know, visual concerns. Oh, um, yeah. Real simple things visual wise. Um, here's a, a magnifying glass, and again, okay. this is just one example. There's lots of different kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular one is actually designed so it's, you can put it around your neck like this here, and then have it in front of you here, so you could work with both hands in front of Underneath. you and see. Oh, okay. But again, you could buy a, a magnifying glass with lights on it. Uh, magnifying glasses that cover an entire page, so the student, you know, things would be enlarged and whatever. Okay. Uh, students that are have visual problems. Uh, often use tape recorders. Uh, this particular tape recorder is one that's specifically for uh, books on tape and whatever, so it's got different speeds and controls on it. Uh, but and that's the something, student is able to control yeah, all of this. Yeah, student would be able to control all okay. of that. And then obviously if a student is totally blind, uh, you'd want to teach them Braille. And so this is Braille. This just is an example of Braille. You can see the, the raised dots and whatever else on it. Okay. And then if you were to print out Braille, it would look something like this. Oh, wow. And again, it looks really complicated yeah, for us, is. but I assume that uh, and part, who's yeah, someone who is blind is able to use that. But those are some, some high, medium, and low type things. Let me show you some things here on the computer that are available. And, there's a lot of questions usually with the computer, so let's sit down here and talk about okay. a couple of options that are available. Um, first of all, let's talk about keyboards. Uh, this here is a key guard that just sits on top of the keyboard like this, which would allow someone without good control of their fingers to lay their hands on here and actually have to work to get their finger through Find to get it. a certain okay. key. Also, you could block out certain keys and whatever, but that's pretty, you know, that's a good idea. Um, this is uh, a little bit fancier. This oh, is an wow. ergonomic keyboard, um, you know, not designed necessarily for people with disabilities, but designed for people who have carpal tunnel and whatever else. But for also, the natural position. yeah, yeah, and okay. you find some people that are, can be, you know, it's going to be easier to use something like this. this. There are also large keyboards. There are keyboards that are arranged in an A B C order instead of the QWERTY key order and okay. things like that. So there's some things there. Um, this is a Macintosh computer, but let me show you a couple of things that are available on here. Uh, if you go into the control panel, there is uh, what's called easy access, and this is on every Macintosh, and it just comes on them. Uh, easy access allows you a couple of things. Uh, one thing is it allows you to change the speed of your mouse. Uh, slow keys allows you to actually do the same thing you're doing on this key guard where you're moving your hand over the top of here, but it won't accept it until you rest on a key. On a key, okay. Uh, sticky keys would allow you to use, to hit two keys at the same time, uh, simultaneously. So if you have someone who is using a, a keyboard with only one finger, they could actually hit shift and then a T and it would do an and uppercase T type okay. of thing. That's what sticky key does. Um, I'm going to turn the slow keys on and then I'll show you how to use that in just a minute, okay? Okay. Uh, another thing that's available here on the Macintosh, and this would be of interest to you 
uh, with a child with, with low vision is on this file here that's called Views. So if I click on the Views folder here in the control panel, uh -huh. it will allow me to change the size of the font on all of the things that you're seeing on the screen. So now you can see, let me oh. get back out of this okay. control panel now. Okay. Uh, but now you can see the icon here in the corner for the Macintosh hard it's drive. It's larger. It's okay. larger, so a student who is having trouble seeing... With visual impairments. Yeah, then. would be able okay. to do that. Great. Uh, and again, those things are all on the Macintosh, every Macintosh, so it's not okay. something that costs anything or that you have to order or whatever. Great. Okay, I'm going to show you here a, what's called CoWriter, which is a word prediction program. Uh, let me just demonstrate it and you'll see the value of it, I think. Okay. Just give me a sentence you'd like to write. Um, how are you today? Okay. Here, all I need to do is hit the H, and oh. it lives, gives me a list of words. Now, how is not in that list of words, but if I hit the O, now how is there is the now number one word. Okay. So all I need to do is hit the number one, oh. and it gives me the word how. You'll notice that it capitalized oh. the word, and now it's predicting what word I'm going to use next. Okay. So there's the word R, so all I need to do is hit the word one. There's oh. R. There's U, so I hit the word three. And today is not there, obviously, so I hit the T. So you just would start to type yeah, the word. Yeah, start to type it. Okay. Okay. There and there it is. it is. Okay. Now, I can use that and use it in any type of word processing program. And if I had a word processing program in here now, I'd simply hit return, and it would go to it. The next step is to assess your students' needs. You've given me so many options as far as the computer, the TDD, all the options that you have given me. How am I to know which is going to be the best for my student? No, that's a really good question. The answer to it is, is similar to you know, other types of situations where we're providing services. Right. You want to look at your child and decide what's best for your child. You want to look at your child and say, what are this child's strengths? What are their weaknesses? What can they do? What can't they do? and then look at the environment that they're in and make those decisions based on the needs of the child. So basically I would myself need to assess, I, I just don't feel qualified to do something like that. Am I going to be the one who needs to assess the child or okay. who do I go to? Generally this assessment is done by some type of multidisciplinary team. Okay? Okay. The IEP team may be involved with that and there are resources available. Um, most districts in Utah have available to them what are called the AAA or the UACT teams. Okay. Uh, these are teams of people that are trained in assessing students on these type of devices. Uh, you know, your special ed director knows about those, those people and can refer them to you or refer you to them. Uh, so if also, I had any questions, would I just get in touch with my special ed? Sure. Oh, or, or the other thing is, in Salt Lake, there is what's called the Utah Center for Assistive Technology. Okay. And there are people there that can answer those questions. And within that center is the Computer Center for Citizens with Disabilities that have all these computers and much, much more type of things that will let kids come in and try and use and try out and okay. see what works and what doesn't work. Okay. So there are really quite a few resources available to Great. us. Great. Now select the most appropriate device. With all of this information, now what do I do? Okay, you need to realize that you want to gather all the information you can and then present that information to the IEP team. And it's the IEP team that's going to make the decisions about what technology is purchased and how that technology is used in the child's education. Finally, monitor the student's use of the device and make adjustments as needed. How am I to know if it's helping the student or hindering the student? I mean, is there yeah. a way to tell? You need to remember that students are constantly changing, and right. so their needs for technology are constantly going to change. Okay. And so you need to constantly be evaluating and monitoring what's happening as far as technology is concerned. Okay, well, great. Now, is there anything else that I need to know? Well, I would just suggest that every IEP you want to consider whether student needs assistive technology or not. And although it's not going to be applied in every IEP, it'd be really nice to just simply ask yourself that question. Is there some technology that's going to help the student okay. in this particular situation? Okay, great. Well, there you have it. There are countless variations of assistive technology to help students with disabilities. So the first critical step is to know what's out there. Then assess your students' needs. There are organizations available that will help you identify, select, and provide the most appropriate technology for your student. Once you've selected the device, monitor its use by the student and make changes if necessary. It's every educator's responsibility 
to develop a basic awareness and understanding of the variety of tools that can be used to enhance students' education. That's all, folks. Supervision is using school staff to oversee and guide students as needed throughout the school day. Supervision also ensures student success and prevents problems. Watch this teacher supervise her students as they line up for recess. You know what, guys, the bell just rang for um, recess, so it's time for us to all get ready. I'm going to call the kids that have been working the very hardest to go first. That means, um, looks like Dynamite Kid has been working hard. He can go be first in line. You need to get your scissors out, Dane, and start cutting down there. Um, Josh is still working. Josh can be second. Oh, and Josh remembered to tuck in his chair. And look how quietly um, Brandon's waiting. And this is the way our line is going. We're going to be right behind Brandon. Perfect. OK, and we're trying not to touch our friends. Um, Jaime can go be third. He's got his pencil moving. He's not just looking around the room. Matthew, quiet hand. What? Oh, we'll fix it after with tape. OK? You've been working hard. Why don't you go get after Jaime? Oh. And Brandon has both arms down to the side because he wants to stay in line and he doesn't want to lose his place. Now, the paraeducator supervises the students as they return to their classroom. Let's see who lined up the right way. Oh, good. Dane remembered not to butt in. He remembered to go to the end of the line. And Bill's doing a good job. His hands are to himself. He's not making any noises. <coughs> Matthew, did you have any problems at recess today? No. no, you had a good recess? Good for you. Boy, Josh, I like the way your hands are to yourself. They're not touching anybody. You're not doing anything with them. You're not making noises. What about Jaime? Did you have a good recess? Yeah. Yeah? I got a super. You got a super recess? Yeah. Students experience more success in instructional environments where effective supervision skills are applied. So, what are these skills that my staff should use? Effective supervision begins with posting school rules. Effective school rules should identify specific behavioral and interpersonal standards or expectations. This enables the school staff to provide consistent and quality supervision. Also, students will understand what is expected. Next, identify times and places where students most often require supervision. Oh, that's easy. In the hallways and restrooms, getting on and off the bus, on the playground, in the lunchroom, and also the school entrances in the half hour before and after school, and, of course, in the classrooms. Wow, there's no place to hide. Cool. And out! Now you can see why all personnel are needed for effective school-wide supervision. To impact students' behaviors, Supervisors must be visible, active, and positive. That is, supervisors should walk around and actively engage students in a positive manner. Let's look at each of the places and times you identified. All right. Between Hi, Chris, classes, good to see you today. supervisors should stand near Hi, their Allison. office or classroom Hi, doors. Hi. In this way, they are visible, accessible, and can interact hey, Joey, positively with students. Too today. Let me sign your calendar. I sure appreciate it when you come to class on time every day. Break is also a good time to supervise restrooms by briefly walking through. Supervisors or drivers should encourage appropriate behavior both on and off the bus by posting bus rules and reviewing them regularly with students. On the playground, supervisors can prevent problems by moving about and interacting with students in a positive and informal manner. In the lunchroom, make sure rules are posted and that more than one adult assists in supervision. The lunchroom can be a great place for students and supervisors to interact. During the half hour before and after school, supervisors should monitor playgrounds, 
hallways, and school exits by being... Let me guess. By being visible, active, and positive. That's right. Of course, supervision takes many forms. Begin by posting your classroom rules. Good supervisors face their students as much as possible, can easily see and access all students, frequently scan the room, praise appropriate behavior, and walk around the room to interact with students. The final step in effective supervision requires a pre-planned, systematic approach to solving problem behaviors. When a student misbehaves, such as pushing in line, ah! approach the student within three feet, gain the student's attention, and establish eye contact. Without arguing, describe the misbehavior to the student. Alan, you are pushing Susan while standing in line. State the rule that was broken. That's not keeping your hands to yourself. Direct the student to comply with it. I need you to keep your arms folded or by your side when you stand in line. Praise the student when he complies. That's the right way to stand in line, Alan. Thanks for following my directions. If he fails to comply, use a pre-planned unpleasant consequence, such as removing the student from the line or response cost. If a student becomes unmanageable, use the school's emergency backup plan. An emergency backup plan? Yes, every school should have a written emergency backup plan or procedure for severe aggression, gang and weapon problems, drugs, property destruction, and inappropriate sexual behavior. Emergency plans usually involve police assistance and a referral process. Remember, if there is a chance of physical harm to you or students, immediately withdraw. Call for faculty assistance and implement the emergency backup plan. Let's review. First, post school rules. Next, identify problematic times and places. Then, as supervisors, be visible, accessible, and positive. Finally, deal with misbehavior using a pre-planned systematic approach. Any questions? Yes. I'd like to implement this level of supervision, but I don't have enough staff to go around. That's a common problem. In many schools, parent volunteers are used as classroom, playground, and bus supervisors. Of course, training and follow-up is essential to ensure their success. Also, students, when properly trained in programs such as conflict resolution, may also assist in supervising the lunchroom, playground, and hallways. With all this extra help, supervision should be a snap. I can still hear the moan of the fiddle as it played Along with the bluegrass band And the people who would gather on Saturday night At the old Grange Hall where we dance Lord, give us strength to live as one in peace and harmony And when the sun sets on another day's end Let us give all our thanks to Thee